He builds his spiral pipes into a huge water revitalizing machine. It is not yet finished, but parts of it are. The hyperbolic funnels are already used in many ponds. The whirling air bubbles reduce the formation of algae in the pond, like on this golf course in the Taunus near Frankfurt. There is also a smaller funnel, a tabletop unit for enlivening drinking water. Jens Fischer has conducted numerous Schauberger Vortex experiments. He sells the first water vitalizing equipment, which has been produced in great numbers since 1980. The so-called Martin Whirler was developed after a suggestion to Victor Sonvalta by a hydraulic engineer. Several thousand devices are also in use in different applications. Numerous bakers report the improved rising of dough and the retarded mould development. The whirler has also been used in hydrotherapy for many years. According to medical opinion, the whirled water can relieve tensions in the neck and shoulder areas as well as ease rheumatic pain. The patients are treated with water that has itself been treated. The water treatment appliances that Victor Schauberger built himself in the 30s were likewise used successfully for therapeutic purposes. Unfortunately, none of the devices from his water laboratory have survived. At the Schauberger Congress in Hör in Sweden with participants from 15 nations, Klaus Rauber and Jörg Schauberger demonstrated the functionality of Victor Schauberger's original suction coil. A kind of pump that sucks the water rather than pushing it. The water is carried smoothly as its flow is not interrupted by paddles. The Swedish hosts have specialized in vortex appliances. They make use of the reciprocal pressure and suction effects within the vortex for different applications. But then, Murphy's Law comes into effect. After the camera is dry again, a visit to nearby Malmo. Jörg Schauberger meets his Swedish friends. In the background is the new Malmo landmark, the Turning Torso, a twisted multi-storey building. Although this building behind me doesn't have anything to do with Schauberger, it still makes me happy to be able to show how something so alive, like a turbulence, a twist, can be made out of something so rigid. Here in Sweden, Malmö is the home of a group which intensively investigates water turbulence. Research into Schauberger and the vortex is well established in Sweden. Because here, Olaf Alexanderson wrote his book, Living Water, one of the standard works about Viktor Schauberger. Here, the legendary IET Malmö group, Kurt Halberg and friends, have continued their researches and they're very close to new discoveries about vortexed water and its applications in everyday life. Kurt Halberg and Anders Eva demonstrate in the laboratory how a whirl jet nozzle can add air into water already at a low pressure. This process is also reversible, to remove air from the water. The jet nozzle has a hyperbolic form and generates a very strong vortex. The air bubbles are drawn into the center. Then a vacuum is created in the center of the vortex. The jet nozzle has proven itself in practice. The vortex generator is built into a cylinder and marketed by the company Watrico, created for this purpose. Small, small bubbles in, the, in uh, the water floats towards the center as the, the uh, rotation will generate a sub-pressure. This is very beneficial for, an example, making ice, as uh, the ice that will be made or frozen by the water treated with the vortexer uh, will have less air inside. It's very good also for altering the uh, uh, floating tendencies of water or the dynamic viscosity 
as the water floats better out on the ice, filling cracks and pores, uh, especially when you are uh, in an ice arena where people are skating and uh, there's a lot of stress on the ice. In this ice rink, a Waterco Vortex generator is attached to the water pipe. Degassed tap water flows into the water tank of the ice preparation machine. The new ice is denser and more resistant, so it lasts longer. This also saves energy. Water is normally heated up to make ice, since one of the many anomalies of water is that warm water freezes more quickly than cold water. Before we had installed the system, the water needed to be heated up to 45 degrees. Sometimes some people use 55 degrees. And as you put out uh, around 10 cubic meters every day, this means that uh, a lot of energy is put into heating 10 cubic meters from, say, 10 degrees from the tap water up to 45 degrees. Today we use only 20 degrees, which means actually you have cut the, the energy costs uh, by 50%. Small wonder then that several ice making machines run with vortexed water. The real ice technique of Watrico has been installed so far in 25 ice rinks, 20 of them in Sweden. Back at the Schauberger Congress in Hör, the American Dan Rees presents his vortex machine. It consists of a series of linked cylinders and purifies the water without any chemicals whatsoever. Uh, I read Living Waters. This is how I got into this. I read a book called Living Waters by Olaf Alexanderson. And Victor Schauberger was the main person in this book. And he, uh, uh, he wanted clean water for everybody. First, Reese uses the vortex tubes to remove iron and sulfur from the groundwater in his native Texas. Now he is trying to desalinate seawater with this energy-saving technique. I know it's possible. It just, uh, it's just a matter of time now. Uh, we're, very, we're, we're pretty close. Uh, uh, just getting uh, chloride removal is very close. Dan Rees has left one machine there. The Swedish team has installed new jet nozzles in order to optimize the development of the vortex. In Malmö Yacht Harbor, Kurt Halberg pumps seawater into a large can. In the laboratory, the water runs through the vortex tubes. With the initial trials, they achieved a significant reduction in the salt content and also the pH value. In the 1930s, Victor, and later his son Walter, experimented with the so-called Kelvin generator. When falling through copper spirals, thin strands of water produce high electrical voltages. Tiny water droplets suddenly change their direction of fall, contrary to the laws of gravity, and move back upwards. This levitation is a phenomenon that had already been investigated in the 19th century by the Nobel Physics Laureate Philip Leonard at waterfalls in the Alps. The tiniest water droplets carry an electrostatic charge. They form a very fine spray that can easily be seen and inhaled. Waterfalls have a positive effect on human health, particularly easing asthmatic complaints. Although over 10,000 volts was generated in the water thread experiment, no significant electrical current was produced. Victor and Walter Schauberger halted their experiments into alternative energy generation. In the beginning of the 1950s, they started a new approach, based on the spiral pipes. They had already used these as the optimum curved shape for their water channels. In 1952, Victor Schauberger's patented spiral pipes were tested at the Stuttgart University of Technology, the legendary purple experiment. 
Schauberger's frequent attacks on academic science, especially on water resource management, caused a number of politicians to commission Professor Purple to test Schauberger's pipes. The aim was to confirm or disprove Schauberger's ideas once and for all. For these measurements, Schauberger provided Franz Purple with some pipes. Amongst others, there was a straight copper pipe, as well as a double-coiled spiral pipe. The aim of these measurements was to test and compare the vortex flow processes within the pipe, in order to determine whether or not this shape of pipe enables the water to pass through with reduced friction. With these measurements, the relationship between friction and the flow velocity within the pipe was determined. There were clear differences between the straight and the spiral pipe. With the spiral pipe in particular, a sort of critical resonance point was discovered, at which the water flowed through the pipe without any apparent resistance. However, some interpolations were made which, at a closer look, would not stand up to scientific investigation. In his preliminary investigations, Professor Purple didn't take enough measurements, especially around those fascinating resonance points. For this reason, the Association for Implosion Research decided to set up the experiments again and repeat the tests. At the time, however, Victor Schauberger was encouraged by the Purple report to make the spiral pipes the core of his own energy machines, for example in his home power station from 1955. This allows energy to be produced from water and air. For Victor Schauberger, conventional explosion technology was the technology of death. With his home power plant, he hoped to stimulate atomic conversion processes through implosion, fulfilling the dream of a non-polluting energy converter that is economical with natural resources. Water jets of enormous force develop in the spiral pipes. But on the very first test run, the pipes burst. A second prototype was drawn up by Victor's collaborator Scherio and built later in Canada. Now this suction turbine has been brought to Germany for closer investigation. Firstly, it's powered by a motor until it reaches a working speed of rotation. After this, water is run into the turbine and the tangential rebound of the water jets with these nozzles causes the rotor to turn by itself so that the drive suddenly starts to run on its own, generating enough electricity to supply a household. The regulation for this entire process is in the lower section. The water flow is controlled with this nozzle. With this small knob we regulate the power output of the generator. Here we have the intake vents. In the center of this fixed part is an ascending coil with a built-in suction coil, another core piece of Schauberger's machines. But first, several components have to be revised and adapted, especially the links between the motor and the generator. Only then can the turbine be accelerated gradually up to 3,000 revolutions per minute. July 2007. At a convention of the Association for Implosion Research, Jörg Schauberger and Klaus Rauber unwrap a long-lost piece of equipment. It is the last Repulsin that Victor Schauberger ever built. In 1958, it was lost in America. The Repulsin was constructed at the time of the miracle weapons of the Third Reich and became a legend after the war. One specimen allegedly took off from the workbench and shattered on the ceiling. From this story, the mythology grew that Victor Schauberger had built the first flying saucer. But what really was the Repulsin? According to a technical drawing of the prototype from 1940, the Repulsin could, among other things, silently power an aeroplane without the need for fuel. A look into the interior of the first Repulsin, a replica that was found in the cellar of the Pythagoras Kepler School in Bad Ischl. In the turbine there are two wavy plates, one on top of the other. 
Air was drawn in through the gill slits between the two plates. Here, Victor Schauberger wanted to mimic the energy processes that are generated in the curves of a riverbed. And then the air is sucked in here through the slots and brought into the diaphragm inside, so that the air flows round here in a circle. Now we just remove the ring so that we can see it a little more easily. Uh -huh.